gardening. Oh, go down the face. Oh, push my hand. Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari 
Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om 
So last night we were introducing the scene on the battlefield at Kurukshetra and we were describing how the two sides had come there. On one side the Pandavas and on the other side the Kauravas. And we quoted the first verse of the Bhagavad Gita, spoken by Dhritarashtra, and how he was inquiring, what did my sons and the sons of Pandu do, being desirous to find? So we were explaining the strong bodily attachment which Dhritarashtra had for his sons. Although he is the guardian and the uncle of the Pandavas, he has no feeling for them and he has no care. His only feeling is towards his own children. The bodily conception of life based on thinking, I am this body and this is mine. So this kind of consciousness was the cause of the Kurukshetra War. The Kurukshetra War took place just with the, just at the time, just before Kali Yuga began. Because Lord Krishna was still present on the planet, therefore Kali Yuga could not actually begin, couldn't take effect. Because Lord Krishna was still present. And even after Lord Krishna departed, we know how Maharaj Parikshit was ruling. And when Maharaj Parikshit was ruling, the personality of Kali also could not really begin to exert his influence on people. But with the cursing of Maharaj Parikshit, and then his departure from the world, and then the scene was set for the personality of Kali to come into effect. And that personality of Kali is very active through promoting this bodily conception of life, which encourages people in all their sinful activities. So the battle of the battle of Kurukshetra was arranged. We could say it was the plan of Lord Krishna that he desired that all of these different kings, different Kshatriyas would all assemble there on the battlefield. Lord Krishna desired that they would all come there and they would fight each other to rel relieve the earth of the burden of so many demonic Kshatriyas. Now Lord Krishna comes into the battlefield of course as the chariot driver of Arjuna. And it's of course very interesting, very surprising that Lord Krishna himself can become the charioteer for Arjuna. Because we know that Previously, when Draupadi was having her Swayamvar, remember we explained last night how Draupadi was born from the fire. She's Yagneshwari, right? Born, she's not an ordinary woman. She was actually like a resident of the higher planets and she came to take part in these pastimes. So, when she had her Swayamvar ceremony, it was arranged, there had to be the archery contest and they had to pierce the eye of the fish with the arrow. They had to fire an arrow through a, a spoked wheel and pierce the eye of a fish. And I think they were not even allowed to look directly, they had to look at the reflection on the surface of the water 
there was a tank of water placed below and the fish was up in, way up in the ceiling and there was a wheel between the fish and the ground and the wheel was rotating so you had to be a very, very special archer to pierce the eye of the fish. Arjuna could do it. He had practiced. Uh, I was just hearing Prabhupada was explaining, he said, Drona had said that Arjuna should never eat in the dark. But it happened one evening while Arjuna was taking food the wind blew out the lights because, of course, in the times of the Pandavas, they didn't have the electric lighting. They just had some oil lamps or some candles blowing. But the wind blew strongly and put out all the lights. But Arjuna continued eating in the dark. And then he thought to himself, if I can eat in the dark, I should be able to fire arrows in the dark also. So he began practicing firing arrows in the dark. Of course it's dangerous. <laughs> Just like Maharaj Dasarath, he was also expert archer and he could also fire arrows in the dark. He could fire without seeing the object, he would just hear and he would fire the arrows. So it happened one time when he was on a hunting uh, expedition in the jungle. He heard a sound in the forest and he fired his arrow. And after he fired the arrow, he heard a human voice cry out. And he rushed forward to see because he was thinking he had hit an animal. He didn't think there was any people in the forest. But he was surprised when he came rushing forward, he found that he fired his arrow into a young man. And the young man had been pierced by the arrow, he was dying, and he told Maharaj Dasarath that I was only coming to get water for my elderly mother and father. My parents are here in the forest with me and I was taking care of them. I had just gone to fetch water for them. You should go and tell them what has happened. You should go and tell my mother and father that I won't be able to come home to them, to give them water. You please take this pot of water, deliver to them and explain to them what has happened. And saying these words, the young man gave up his life. He died. He left the body. So Maharaj Dasarath took that pot of water and he went to find the young man's mother and father. And he felt, he found the elderly couple. They were very much elderly. They were not hardly able to move, to take care of themselves. They were They were, they were completely dependent on the care of their son and their son had departed from the world. So when Maharaj Dasarath came and told the couple what had happened, Vastu, <laughs> Uh, Maharaj Dasarath <laughs> Maharaj Dasarath <laughs> So Mah Maharaj Dasarath came and told the couple and the old man told Maharaj the old man told Maharaj Dasarath that 
that your sin is very great. You have done a great sin. You have killed our helpless son who did no wrong to you. So he told Maharaj Dasarath, he said, as we have to give up our life without our son being present, in the same way you will also die without your son being present. Usually the son is there at the time of death to take care of the father. It's the culture. Before the father departs, he wants to see the son there and he will pass over the responsibility of the family maintenance to the son, right? Son is representative of the father. So Maharaj Dasarath was cursed in this way. And the elderly couple, when they heard their son had been killed, they also gave up their bodies. They also entered into fire, gave up their bodies because they thought, there's no point to live anymore. Our son is not here to take care of us. We are helpless. They gave up their own bodies. And Maharaj Dasara, he had to suffer for that. So later on, of course, Lord Rama went into exile and Bharat and Shatrugna, or Lakshman had gone with Ram into the forest and Bharat and Shatrugna were away from home. And it was at that time Maharaj Dasarath left the world. Although he had four sons, not one of them could be with him when he departed from the world. Now no more. So, so Maharaj, we were telling about, uh, what was that I was talking about? Huh? huh? Oh yeah, yeah, the four sons, yeah. Uh, the, the generally, the father likes to be present when, or likes the son to be present. So, Maharaj, the five Pandavas, they were without their father. They were under the care of Dhritarashtra. But Dhritarashtra was not caring for them. So they had, a, they had a very unpleasant dealing with the Kauravas. And the result was ended in war, that there had to be a war. Although they tried many other attempts to avoid the war, ultimately there was no alternative but to go to battle. Even Lord Krishna himself had gone as a messenger to the home of Dhritarashtra and begged them, you know, let's not have war, let's avoid this war. But they didn't want to hear. Even at that time Duryodhana tried to arrest Krishna. He tried to take Krishna a prisoner. So at that time Lord Krishna revealed his universal form. He took a universal form. And Duryodhana understood he couldn't capture Krishna, no matter, no way he could capture Krishna. So I was explaining about Draupadi, how she wanted, she was having her Swayamvar ceremony and she was to select a husband and it was to be decided through this archery contest. And so Karan also wanted to take part. Now Karan actually was the son of Kunti, but nobody knew because Kunti was the unmarried woman at the time when she'd been given the blessing of Durvasa that she could call any demigod. And so she was not married at this time, but she thought, let me try. And she called the demigod Surya 
and the result was she gave birth to Karn. And Karn was born with golden ears, earrings, and he also had some on the chest, eh? some kavacha ah, on the chest. And so he, he was a very uh, special child. But Kunti's not married. So for the young woman to have a child without the husband, very embarrassing. You know, what do they do today if the young girl has a child, no husband? They don't even want to have the child. They go for abortion or something. They kill the child. That's the, the Kali Yuga mentality. That, oh, I'm pregnant, I'll go to a hospital, get abortion. Very common thing these days. Even sometimes the married women, they don't want the child. They go for abortion. Very common. More common in some countries than others. And some people, they go many times for abortions. Not just once, but many times. So, this is Kali Yuga. Anyway, Kunti didn't do that. She gave birth to the child, and then when the child was born, she put the child on some little raft and sent it down the river. And then that raft was found by one man who was a chariot driver. Right? He was another chariot driver is like laborer, like sudra, working class, not noble class, not kshatriya, not even vaishya, just sudra, just worker. So the, the child was found by this man and taken to his home and he showed his wife and they decided, let's keep this child, very lucky, the young boy, looks very nice, got these gold ears and the kavacha on him. Very auspicious, we'll take, keep him for our own child. Because obviously, child's put on the river, nobody wants him. Just like there's a story in Mayapur, when we go on Parikrama, we come to the, this one place, uh, Saranga Morari, Sar, Saranga's Morari. There was this one man called Saranga Thakur. He was a very elderly man. And Lord Chaitanya told him, he said, why you don't take disciples? He didn't have any disciples. So Lord Chaitanya chastised him. He said, why you don't take disciples? And so Saranga Thakur said, tomorrow the first person I meet, I will take him for disciple. So Lord Chaitanya was pleased. So the next morning Saranga went to take his bath in the Ganga. And it was dark, and he went in to take his bath. He touched a dead body. There was this body floating down the Ganga. It was on one of these boats, just like they put this curtain on the boat. So this young man's body was also on the boat. And Saranga touched that body with his foot. And when he touched it, the body came to life. The body sat up. And Saranga was surprised. He said, oh, what happened? And the man said, the young, it was a young man, he was only like 14, 15 years old. And he said, I was bitten by a snake and I became unconscious. My family must have thought I was dead. They put me on, so they had the custom there that somebody is bitten by the snake, they're unconscious. They don't know if he'll come back to life or not. So they didn't cremate the body, but they put him on the Ganga and they put him on a boat and they let the boat go down the Ganga. And so he came back to life and he, st he stayed with Saranga. He became known as Murari, Saranga's Murari. And he became a great devotee because he died before he wasn't afraid. He wasn't afraid of death. Even the wild animals would come. The lion would come. He'd slap them. <laughs> He'd play with them. He wasn't afraid because he'd already died one time before. 
Even his family came. They wanted to take him home. They said, oh, you're our, our son, you should come home. But he said, no, no, no. You already sent me away. You put me on the Ganga. You give me up for dead. Now my life is here with Saranga Thakur. He stayed with Saranga Thakur. And nice temple is there. You can see the deities which they worshipped not far away from Mayapur. So, the same way Karn was put on the boat and he was found by this couple and taken to their home. And the man was the chariot driver. So, the son also became, a, a, you know, became identified as belonging to that kind of caste. But the father's a chariot driver, son is also on the same level as the father. You know, this is not, not correct, but this is how it often is. This is called the caste system. And this is why Buddhism came up in India, because of the caste system. Because people were identified by birth. By birth somebody is a Brahmin. Now Krishna doesn't say that in the Bhagavad Gita. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Chatur Varnam Maya Shristam Guna Karma Vibhagasha. He said one is known, well, the one's position in society is known by Guna and Karma. Guna means quality and Karma means activity. He doesn't say birth. He doesn't say Janma. He says Guna. And karma. But people took it by birth. They said, my father's a Brahmin, I'm also Brahmin. Prabhupada said, if your father is high court judge, does it mean son is also high court judge? No, cannot. Father is a doctor, does it mean son is also doctor? No, son has to also go and study and become qualified. So the same, so, but this is the, the problem with the caste system. This is why Buddhism came, came up, because Buddha came to, as a reaction against the caste system, because he saw the corruption which the caste system brought. That people were put into the position of being sudra, even though they may have good qualities. So the Shastra actually say, if one has the qualities of a Brahmin, even he is born in the Sudra family, he should be known as a Brahmana. And if one has the qualities of a Sudra, even if he's born in a Brahmana family, he should be known as a Sudra. Just like today we see there are people, Brahmanas, and they're, they're working in the butcher shop. I was, uh, I remember one time I was in England doing book distribution and I came past this butcher shop and there was this one Indian man in the shop there and he shouted to me, he said, hey, hey, look, I'm a Brahmana. <laughs> and he showed me his Brahmin thread. And in one hand he had the big knife and he was cutting the meat. So what nonsense, you see, this is a Kali Yuga, you see, people are thinking. I am the Brahman, even though I have no qualities. So, Karn was brought up in this family and he became known as the son of a Sudra, the son of a chariot driver. So when it came time for Draupadi Swayamvar, Karn also wanted to take part because Karn was also very expert in firing arrows. And he thought he could also win the hand of Draupadi. But Draupadi said, no, 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 just a minute. He cannot take part. I cannot marry him. I cannot become his wife because he's from the low class family. Right? Draupadi is the daughter of Draupada. And Draupada is a king. So Draupadi cannot just marry any worker, any ordinary low-class person. So 
So she refused to allow him to take part. So it was a great insult against Karn. Right? It was really very painful for Karn. After that, Duryodhan, he gave a kingdom to Karn. He made him, he said, you, he said, I give you a kingdom, I make you a king, I make you a ruler. Now, then you can take, but it was already too late. Draupadi had already rejected him from, but afterwards Duryodhan gave him the kingdom. But you can understand how Karn had so much hatred towards the Pandavas, because at the time of the Swayambar, it was Arjuna who won, who, who took Draupadi, and then he took her home, and he took her home, and he told his mother, Mother Kunti was inside the house, and he told his mother, he said, Mother, I've won a prize. And Kunti is in the house, and she said she didn't know what prize he had won. So she told him, whatever you've won, you must share it with your brothers. <laughs> That's a problem, right? Because he had won Draupadi. So to share the woman with his brothers, my goodness, you know, that was a real challenge for them. Anyway, great sages like Vyasa came there and said, no, it's all right. This has happened before, that sometimes in the past, great men also, uh, they accept the, the w woman was shared by more than one husband. So it's not irreligious. You can do it, but certain conditions, certain principles have to be followed. So it was arranged. Draupadi would be the wife. First of all, she would marry all five Pandavas, and then she would stay with each husband for one year. So she, her name is Panchali. Panchali means one who has five husbands. Hmm? So for one year she was with Yudhisthira, he was the oldest. And then for one year she was with Bhima. After Bhima had been with her for one year, he said, I want to stay with her for another year. <laughs> <laughs> he was not willing to give her up. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, she stayed with each of the five Pandavas, one, one after another, and by each Pandava, she begot one, one son. So she had five sons. Of course, these five sons, they were all killed at the end of the battle of Kurukshetra. They were all killed by Ashwatthama, the son of Drona. So this whole battle of Kurukshetra involves so much intrigue, so much dispute among the family members. Although they're family, they're not united. They're, there's this difference, us and them. Right. Pandavas and Kauravas. They make distinction. This is very dangerous for us. We have to be very careful not to make these kind of distinctions and to see the unity, particularly in our Krishna consciousness movement. Jai Sri Sri Radha Krishna Kanaya Ki Sri Sri Nitai Karangarai. So we want to encourage all of you on this Christmas Eve to, that we will all work together in great harmony, helping each other to become Krishna conscious, to keep Srila Prabhupada's family united. As Prabhupada had often said, had, as we're often told, Prabhupada said, your love for me will be shown by how you cooperate with each other after I am gone. 
And so generally Christmas is a time for coming together, the family comes together, at least in the Western science society like that, just like in Chinatown you have Chinese New Year and you have the Chuanjiafanna, you know, everybody comes to take the food together, they eat the meal together. So the same way Christmas also we come together, you know, and we have also, of course, we have our festivals like Jan Mastami, Gorpunima, we have many occasions where we need to come together and we need to feel the, the strength and the unity, not the difference, not the disputes, but the unity and the togetherness. They need to help each other and care for each other and to conquer over this bitterness and envy and animosity, all these bad things which are there, which were shown by the Kauravas headed by Duryodhan. Lord Krishna didn't want them to rule. He wanted the Pandavas should rule because the Pandavas had the good qualities. They were the saintly people. So he wanted that they would be victorious. So this is the, the teaching of Bhagavad Gita. And the conclusion is, wherever there is Krishna, the master of all mystics, and Arjuna, the expert bowman, there will be victory, morality, extraordinary power and opulence. And it's a fact. If we keep Krishna and Arjuna there in the center, if we remember we are their servants, then we will always be successful. Okay, so we'll have some kirtan for Radha Krishna Kanaya now. Just a short class. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Yeah.